I, I believe you said uh, a few times that you felt like maybe you might have retired too soon, like you had a few good years left. Yeah, I, you know, I think that started because did you ever have anybody come up to you and say, hey, man, how much longer are you going to drive? All the time. You did? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that started with me. And, and one guy that's a great friend of mine that, that got under my skin, uh, it was at Indy for the Brickyard 400 with Jerry Punch. And I like Jerry a lot. Great friend of mine. And he walked up to me, ran him, and said, hey, Rusty, uh, he's interviewing me. We're talking. And one of the last questions was, how much longer do you think you're going to stay doing this? And I'm like, why in the hell would he ask me that question, you know? And then all of a sudden I get these questions from somebody else, you know. Hey, how much longer are you going to keep on going? And then I'm down to Daytona one time, and Bill France Jr. comes up and said, how much longer are you going to keep doing this? And I'm going, okay, I'm getting all these questions. There's something going on. Because what was going on, the reason I'm getting these questions is because I was on like a 65-race losing streak. Oh. You know, and they're like, oh, man, everything's going the wrong way. Probably the same stuff Jimmy Johnson's getting, you know. Right. Currently. Right. And so I got thinking about that. And then I go to the banquet, and I'm hearing these TV guys wanting to start doing this stuff. You know, they start coming up to me, wanting me to go to work and do TV. ESPN was one of them and asked me to come up and rehearse, and I did all that, and they liked all that. And so then I tell RP about it, and he goes, you know what, man, you've accomplished everything you really have done in this sport. I know you want to win Daytona, and you haven't done that, uh, but everything else you're pretty well done. And he said, he said maybe this time to start thinking about it, you know. And uh, I said, okay. So then I get this offer from ESP, and I said, let's do it. Let's pull the trigger. Let's go announce it, you know. And so in 2004, I announced I'm going to quit. And I'll never forget, I'm at, I'm at um, Homestead, Florida, 2005. Finished like 11th in a race or something. Pull off the track, and I'm going, this is the stupidest decision I ever made in my entire life. What in the world am I doing, you know? Well, how did I get myself wow. talked into this? How did I go down this road? And I got out of that car, and I was the emptiest I ever felt in my life. And then I go around, uh, the very next thing I do, I go to an IndyCar race because ESPN didn't get the deal to 2007, and I retired in 05, so I'd have an 06, nothing going on, so I want you to call Indy. So I called the Indianapolis 500, I did all this stuff, and had a great time doing it, but I just felt empty, you know? Mm. Man, it was, and I, I, it, that took a long time to get over. Right. It wasn't, and still... Every, I was standing in front of your building a little while ago, and there's six kids out there with a bunch of die-cast cars. And so I sure wish you'd get back in the car, man. Come on, get back in the car. Why'd you do this? That was a stupid. And the guy looked me in the eye and said, that was a stupid move. And I go, <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take you to get over it? Five years? It took me, no, it took me longer than that. It took Ten? me like eight years to get over it. And uh, wow. I, I got a phone call from Daytona. They want me to go to Daytona and run a Ferrari in the Ferrari Challenge. Had 123 cars show up. And uh, I thought I was just going down to do a show. And I said, no, man, we want you to go down there and be serious and try to win this Ferrari Challenge event. I said, why you want me? He said, because you're not driving now. And Ferrari said, get one of those retired NASCAR guys to compete with our guys, you know. And the Ferrari Challenge cars are super fast cars, you know. I mean, they're 200 mile an hour cars. I went to Austin, Texas and tested for two days in this Ferrari. Then I went to Daytona. 123 cars showed up. I finished 10th. And I was pretty happy, happy with that. And then I got the juices flowing again. I said, man, I got to get back in this car. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. What year was that? Then I, got, then I got drunk one night with one of my friends. And this is a true story. I, I was up Finally, the, he gets drunk. I was up in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> I was up in the mountains, and I'm sitting there one night. And a friend of mine was there. And uh, there was a guy named uh, Billy Nash. And Billy and I were having some beers. And he said, I have a stupid you getting out of that car. And Childress has called me. He said, man, he said, I, as soon as I retired, he's like, you need to get back and get in one of my cars. So I called him up. I said, all right, I'm going to come out of retirement. I'll, I'll drive your car. He says, I can't do it. I said, why? He said, I just hired Clint Boyer. I got no room now. Oh. <laughs> wow. So did you ever get an offer that you really considered? No, I never, I never did. Get Was there that. any rumor that DEI called you at one time to see if you wanted to come drive for DEI? No. No? Never did get that. Wow. Not that I know of, you okay. know. Okay, yeah. So, uh, so that, that's kind of that stuff. You yeah. Know? I think about it all the time when I go to, like, yesterday at Martinsville, I see my old car win the race, the two-car wins, and it doesn't win by a little bit. It just dominates, you know? Right. Was it wins both stages and wins 445 laps? Yeah. I used to call that. Every time I would win these old races, i get out of the car and i tell old Roger Penske. He said, man, that went good. He said, what'd you do? I said, I popped open a can of whoop-ass, man, is what I did. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that's what that was yesterday or uh, the other day at Martinsville. Without... 
Dr. Jerry Punch starting the string of questions, and without that, what, what year do you think you would have raced to then without the, the pressure probably, to retire? Probably, probably 08. So probably, another four or five probably years. Probably three more years. If you remember, Mark Martin and I, we uh, announced almost the same time that we're going to retire together. And we retired, and we went to Sears Point, and Fox brings out rocking chairs for both of that, us. I remember. Presents that to us on our start-finish line, and, and we're getting keys to the city all year long. <laughs> we're getting all these accolades and all these cool things. And three-quarters way through the year, Mark says, nope, I've made a mistake. I am not retiring. Right. And he just pulled out of the deal. And uh, did you look at him and go, hmm, maybe I should do that too? Yes. Right. Hell yeah, I did. I said, well, so I'm out here in this island all by myself now, and I'm retiring, and it's, I'm still thinking it's stupid. But I had one of the smartest guys in the world, and that's Penske. He said, don't listen to that noise. You're making the right decision. You're making the right decision. You need to start focusing on those car dealerships. You need to start focusing on business, and you need to get that race car stuff out of your head right now. <laughs> You've done that. And I said, all right. He's the one that calmed me down the very most. And my wife, Patty. Patty was like, for sure it's great having you at home, you know, and it was mm-hmm. just she liked that better. So being sponsored by Miller all uh, most of your career, did you race the other beer cars a little harder than, than everybody else? Yeah, I think I had to a little bit, you know. Because, boy, I tell you what, it was like the big three in Detroit. If a Chevy beats a Ford, everybody talks about it. Well, that's Miller guys. They did not want to hear that Budweiser car beat that, 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 that other car. <laughs> that's true. So, yeah, no, yeah. I, that is absolutely true. Yeah. I remember from our oh, Budweiser yeah. days. Our Budweiser guys are the same way. Yes. They, when they looked at the finishing order, they want to know where the Miller car was and the Corcus car was. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I asked that because um, – one of the one of our listeners uh, hit us up on social media and said it seemed like he always raced you harder than everybody else, and I felt that too on the racetrack. Uh, I felt the competition, I think, between our sponsors, and I was racing the field and the the Miller car, yeah, and the course car, you know. And but I remember one of the one of the first lessons that you taught me. You might not even been intentionally trying to teach me anything, but I, we were racing at Atlanta in 1999. I had a five race schedule. And I had never ran on a big track before uh, too many times. Didn't have a lot of big track experience. And we went down into turn one, and you were on my door, and I almost spun out. I'd never been in that situation before where you could take the air off of the side of a car. you know. And, and, my, and I almost spun out. We, we raced all day long, it seemed like, that race. And uh, I learned so much. When you're... You know, when you're in that point in your career, this is 99, uh, you had you were in- inevitably put with younger drivers as teammates. Did you feel like you were a mentor? Uh, did you enjoy having teammates, working with teammates, teaching younger guys, or was that sort of, you know, kind of on the back burner compared to what you were trying to do with your own career? Uh, look, I got to tell you, I, I'm not proud of what I'm about to say. I was, <laughs> I was never good at that. Yeah. I was never good at saying, I'm going to get a teammate and I'm going to teach a teammate. I remember when your dad came up to me and we were children, so we're going to get a teammate. He told me, so I'm sick of this teammate crap. I said, why? He said, because I'm the veteran and I feel like I got to be spending half my time teaching them. He said, they're not coming up teaching me. They're not helping me. The, all the information is flowing the other way and it's draining me. I don't like it, you know. And then my particular deal with Newman, it just got competitive. It just got competitive, and it was just personalities were totally different. Um, it got to where he didn't like me, and I didn't like him, and that's what it was, you know. And um, I tried to get better, and we, we, we had hot and cold years, but I just wasn't real good at all that teammate crap. I really wasn't, yeah. you know. And I remember talking about – I was talking to Rick Hendrick about it, and I told him one time, I said, man, we're talking about getting a young guy and. And this and that. And he said, hell, if I need a young guy, I'll go find one and steal from somebody else. <laughs> That's what he said. That's right. He said, I'll go find one and steal from somebody else. You know, he said, this tutoring all this young guy stuff and spending all this money, you know, let somebody else do it. And so I'm, I'm – but I am I, I'm, uh, happy that guys like you and guys like Kyle Bush are spending all that money and time bringing these new guys up because nobody else is probably going to do that. 